Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the intersections between education and justice, a conversation with DeRay McKesson. Uh, my name is Danny Mejia Cruz, a member of the class of 2016 and president of the Bowdoin Student Government. And my name is, Ash oh. and my name is Ashley Bomboka. I'm a member of the class of 2016 as well, and I am the president of the African American Society. <laughs> Thank you. Ashley and I will be co-leading tonight's conversation. Before we get started, we would like to thank the organizers for tonight's event, the Student Center for Multicultural Life, the McKean Center for the Common Good, and the Career Planning Center, as well as Teach for America, for, help, for their help in bringing in DeRay here tonight. We would also like to take a moment as we juggle and discuss issues around diversity this evening to recognize that tonight, is, tonight at sunset begins the Jewish high holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. We realize that some of you may have to leave early in observance of this holiday, and others are not able to join us. For those observing the holiday, we wish you an easy fast. We are fortunate to have DeRay McKesson back at Bowdoin again tonight. Last spring, he joined us to talk about his work as an activist. His talk inspired many as he called upon us to reflect on the common good and our own role in the fight for justice. He said, and I quote, I think of the common good as being a commitment to working on issues that benefit more people than you. I think that education like this privileges you in such an incredible way and that we will all fight differently in the work, but it's important that you fight because you do have a gift that people, so many people, would die to have. Today, DeRay joins us again this time with a focus on the intersection between education and social justice. After his remarks, Danny and I will moderate a conversation with DeRay based on questions submitted by a wide array of Bowdoin community members in advance of this evening. If time allows, we will open for additional Q&A. DeRay McKesson is an activist, organizer, and educator. He came into the national spotlight with his involvement in the protests surrounding the shooting of Michael Brown an unarmed 18-year-old African-American man by a white Ferguson, Missouri police officer. In Ferguson, DeRay began documenting his experiences and the events taking place on the ground via Twitter. This gave the movement leaders and protesters a place to keep the world instantly informed on the state of the movement. Today, DeRay has 229,000 Twitter followers. In addition, he is the founder and co-editor of the Ferguson Protest Newsletter, and along with fellow activist Janetta Elzey, WeTheProtesters.org, launched, uh, WeTheProtesters.org launched Mapping Police Violence, which collects data on people killed by the police. DeRay is simultaneously on the ground and on the airwaves and social media. He has participated in discussions on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, on MSNBC with Melissa Harris Perry, and has written for the Huffington Post. In March of this year, the Los Angeles Times named DeRay one of the new civil rights leaders for the 21st century. In May, he and Elsie were profiled in the New York Times Magazine in an article entitled, Our Demand is Simple, Stop Killing Us. The two were awarded the Howard Zinn Freedom to Write Award in 2015 for their activism, and they were named to Fortune's World's Greatest Leaders List for their work with the Black Lives Matter movement. DeRay is an educator, having worked for the Harlem Children's Zone, and he was a teacher, and he is a teacher for America alum, having taught sixth grade math in New York City. In addition to these many achievements, we are especially proud that DeRay McKesson is a Bowdoin College alumnus from the class of 2007. While at Bowdoin, he was president of the Bowdoin Student Government twice, once while he was also class president. It is our great pleasure to welcome DeRay McKesson back to Bowdoin College. So it is, you know, this is, when we think about to be at home in all lands and all ages, Bowdoin is, um, Bowdoin remains a magical place to me. It is humbling to be back. I appreciate all of you coming. Um, and I think there are a couple more seats up here for anybody who needs a seat. But 
this is incredibly humbling. I'll say thank you to, to so many familiar faces. Uh, I had a great conversation with Clayton today, the new president, and, and any of you know that like Barry is a dear friend of mine and I love him and um, the college I think is a different place without him, but I met Clayton today and I also love Clayton. So I, you know, <laughs> I, I remain proud to be a Bowdoin alum and I went into the conversation like, I don't know about Clayton. Um, you know, and I was asking people like, what do you think about Clayton? And they, everybody was like, he's nice, but like, you know, it's Bowdoin, so everybody says everybody's nice, but, but I really liked him. So I am like, I, I just want to say publicly that I, um, if it matters to anybody, it matters to me. <laughs> but I like Clayton Rose. I'm proud to be an alum. And then so many other people. I think about Kim Pacelli. I think about Dean Foster. I think about Randy. I remember Randy's first day at the college. I saw Eli today when I went to Clayton's office, who now works up there. Um, and, and so many students that I saw before they were students here, like Justin, who worked at Baltimore City Public Schools um, when I was there, and so many other people. So I'm humbled to be back home, um, a place that has always been magical to me. I'll just say a couple of things before we jump right into this conversation. And it's great to be with you guys. You know, I love student government. So when I saw him yesterday in the union, I was like, do you still have the gavel? Like we had, you know, we got the gavel. He does. He might trade it in for like a bigger gavel, whatever that means. Um, but we did have this conversation yesterday. So in the movement space, one of the most important things that we've been able to do is like have conversations about blackness. Like when we talk about blackness, it is no longer taboo. We've opened up space to talk about race in a way that's really powerful. I think that so much of the movement space has been about creating uh, new, like sort of redefining the public sphere. Twitter for us has been a place where discourse is now happening amongst people of color that has never happened before. I often think, and I said this before, but I think about um, the black people, we've always faced these issues of erasure and erasure manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or it's told by everybody but us. And in this moment, we became the unerased. We literally got to tell stories in ways that pushed back on dominant culture narratives, but also allowed us to talk to each other differently in blackness. And that was really important. I think about the space that again protest has opened up we know that protest is not the solution but what it does again is create space for the solution work to happen and talking about education um, i worry sometimes that we veer towards the absolute so it is either you love charter schools or they are the worst things that ever happen to kids either you test students um, and it's like a testing only or you don't test and we do you know an alternative to people opt out of testing um, or it's like you close this one school, either you like support school closures or you don't support school closures because schools should always be open. And there's something about the danger of the absolutes, especially in education, that kids lose when we fight about it, when we fight in a way that the absolutes become our only options. So I always worry when that happens. As somebody who taught sixth grade math, and then I was the number two in human capital in Baltimore City Public Schools and in Minneapolis Public Schools, I got to see education in so many different ways. And one of the things that I've always said to people when they talk about education to me is that they often think about classroom, that people really talk about a school when people express their ideas about like public education they really are talking about like one specific school not like a system of schools and what does it mean to talk about change at scale is something i always push people to think about and again i worry about like this language of the absolute i you know get into a lot of twitter twitter moments with people because i'm on twitter and um i tweeted not too long ago that like programs help expand our understanding of what's possible. Like the Black Panthers breakfast program that as you probably know, led to the federal government making a, a national breakfast program for kids. Um, and then I said charter schools and then people, I got this big backlash. How dare you compare the Black Panthers to charter schools and da da da, which is not what I did. But there was this thing uh, <laughs> at all, but there was this thing for people like, I want you to remember that charter schools started as like, an opt-out movement in Minnesota by teachers, right? It wasn't, what charter schools had become is like a whole different story, but that's not what they started out as. And again, like not every charter school is, is the same charter school as like the worst thing you can possibly imagine. And when we enter these conversations about education and so many other things where the worst possible example becomes the root of how we think about something, that actually isn't what it means to be in discourse with people. I'd also say, um, you know, when we think about liberal, liberal arts education is you won't get a liberal arts education just because you're at a liberal arts school. It's something you actually have to work towards, right? You have to like craft a, an education program that like provides you an education that really opens your world. You could go through these four years at Bowdoin studying the same thing, right? Like not pushing yourself to live a different life, to like think different things. And there is this seductive lie that tells you that being at a liberal arts college guarantees a liberal arts education and, it, and that is not true. It, like so many other things it requires work on your part. 
And I also offer that like you have to step into the world and do the work that there's only so much you can read about and think about and fight about as an idea. And, you know, I, I believe in the in the fundamental power of ideas, but you have to do the work to and engage in the work. And I push all of you to think about like how, what that means to you. For me, it meant like being in classrooms after after college. It meant like going to cities in the summer and like doing work on the ground. And now it means standing in streets and also standing in places like the White House and meeting with Bernie Sanders and those sort of things. But it requires like an, an immersion in the world itself that like there's a limit to how much we can think about these things. But the thinking about it is really important because it sets you up to actually act in ways that make sense. Um, there's this thing that I see the Orient is tweeting, whoever is here, I see you. <laughs> um, is, there's another core belief about like organizing without organizations, right? Like I fundamentally believe that the that the digital space has allowed us to think about what it means to digitally organize, to create um, to create relationships that we can leverage to be power in new and fundamental ways. And I talked about that in the class I had with Professor Henry, who was here when I was here, and I love her. Um, and, and what does that mean, right? How do we continue to explore these new frontiers of what the social media space has allowed us to do? Like like was said before, I have about 200 and 200,000 followers. I get about 100 million impressions, sort of interactions with my tweets every um, 28 days. And there's a large reach there. And like, how do we use that to actually like bring people together in new and powerful ways? Is like a question that we are still exploring. There used to be a time where like to, to base build and to think about access, you needed structure. Like there had to be an organization to do those things. And we actually just don't need that anymore. There's like a new phase where we can actually create sort of base building, create relationships, get access to things without organizations. So in so many ways, organizations become things that we use to rally around certain actions. We like create structures to like, to rally around a specific goal or a specific action as opposed to needing the organization itself to like create the, the impetus for um, people coming together in the first place. And the last thing I'll say before I go to the questions and I've not read the questions beforehand, so you know, we'll see what you say, is, you know, I often joke that Twitter and the classroom remain the last two radical spaces in America. That like when I think about the power and primacy of ideas, th this notion that like the way we think about the world is how we live the world, that the classroom remains this place where like thinking about the world is the currency. Like it is the way you enter the space, like you fight about ideas or something so magical about that. I was telling Clayton today when he asked me about sort of my Bowdoin time, I said that I fell in love with my mind here at the college and that is true. I'll never forget being in Yarbrough's class um, and we read and Yarbrough is, you know, something else. And, um, and we read The Republic and in the first page of The Public Socrates is called back to the city and and in that moment it, it highlights like the tension between wisdom and power and that changed me I will never forget that feeling I will never forget that moment I will never forget that part of the text um, and I was a different reader after that and like that is something about the idea that's really powerful and Twitter again is a place where like ideas can spread and take life and take hold in ways that are really magical um, so I'll end by reminding you all and myself that I love this place and I'll go over here Mm, I don't know. Uh, okay. I know it's like hands up, y'all. Hands up. <laughs> not me. Not me. Okay. Okay. All right. So, thank you, Jure, for joining us. Um, this is very exciting. It's so so public um so <laughs> very excited um but you know what why don't we jump in um and we can start with the title of this dialogue the intersection between education and justice what do you see that intersection to be and how do you think your educational experience prepared you for being in activism for social justice issues yeah, somebody asked me the other day, like, what would, you know, I would totally go back to the classroom. I taught sixth grade math. I loved it. I'd probably maybe not teach math. I mean, I like teaching math and I was a good math teacher. But I would think about teaching like humanities or something. I think about classrooms as a place where we, we have told the story of resistance wrong in so many ways. I think about Montgomery as um, like the, the story of the civil rights movement, uh, briefly the Montgomery bus boycotts, for instance. Like I didn't know that it was like a random professor who like printed off 50,000 flyers, got two students together and started the boycott. Like the story that I, I always been told had been about SNCC and SLC and King and, and they came down after she started, but like she started it. Like she went around Montgomery passing out the flyers. And, and that like changes the way people enter the conversation about the, the boycotts. And like there's so much of the power of like 
classrooms have become this place where the power of storytelling becomes real in a different way. And I would push all teachers to tell stories better. I'd like to tell, especially stories of resistance, much better than they do at all levels, especially in elementary school and, and middle school, and validating uh, people's ability to tell stories. I like stories come in tweets, they come in pictures, they come in prose. I like The way we share our experiences can be varied and they all are legitimate. It's something that I feel like we don't actually tell people enough. And then how my education, um, and in terms of justice, I think that there's like a fundamental thing about like resistance, right? That telling people that the world we live in is not the world we have to live in, right? That like we can actually like make a better world and that's part of our work. And that this and idea- you definitely see teachers engaging with, in that conversation with students. Yeah, yeah, I think about like some of the first ways that you have started to begun to think about the world is like in classrooms, right? That like mm -hmm. when you think about being socialized to interact with each other, like all of that stuff like happened in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of Bowdoin, it's this notion of the common good is actually not an abstraction, right? It's not like an abstract idea. It is like a, it is an act, right? Um, and I think Bowdoin in that sense, I was telling Clayton today that like, gave me this sense of possibility. Like I could do anything, right? We could talk about anything. I could, I'd never been in a place where everybody was smart before until I came to Bowdoin, even the people I hated. I was like, you are smart, that's great. Um, <laughs> And I didn't hate many people, but there were definitely some people I was like, how did you get in? And then it was like, you are, you're like the best. There was this one guy who I now like, um, you know, <laughs> now that I've been out for so long, but he like is a phenomenal sculptor. And if you ever met him, the last thing you think he was doing on his free time is sculpting, but he is. And, and like that also, um, Bowden made me believe in people differently. I think going back to your opening remarks about how you were sitting in your bro's classroom and you fell in love with your mind and you had that transformative experience, could you talk about any other trans transformative experiences you had at Bowdoin, both in the classroom and outside? Yeah, in the classroom, I'm trying to think what else I, oh, I took this um, class with Goodrich in the English department. And we would like read a theory. We'd read like a feminist piece or a queer theory or something else. And then we'd have to read like a random book. It was like, as, I don't know, they were random to me. We read random books. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we like had to read the theory into the text. And I remember it being like such a phenomenal like intellectual exercise because we like really had to try and make it work. Um, and that changed me. Like I like became a better reader there because she like really put, because it was things that like seemingly had no intersection. And then we had to sort of read in Foucault into this book that like, you know, you're like, I don't know where, I don't know what power is. Um, so that was really interesting. And I love that. Like that's a class I really remember. And she was tough. Um, and are those, so you said you read, you read feminist theory, you read, all queer theory, cultural theory, do those continue to inform or were they strictly academic experiences for you? Do you see your academic experiences really creeping into the day-to-day -day of your activism? Yeah, in the, so on a macro level, I think it like helped me think better. Like I got to like, I engage with so many arguments and like I can be, I could just like play with ideas better because I was exposed to so many at a place like this. And then people like Bell Hooks, you know, Bell Hooks like changed my life. I like had never heard, I never read somebody sort of complicate black culture in a complex way, right? Like I, like when she talks about the danger of soul food, the movie, I was like, Bell, look at that. You know, like this idea that like, what does it mean when people, when black, when in images of entertainment, black people come together to deal with pain around food and how that like reinforces these negative terms about black people, I was like, Look at you, Belle. So that was, you know, that was big. And I took this one class about the, uh, with, I can't remember her name, Julie something, who, about like black um, photos, black photography, and like the importance of black of photos in black homes. And I never thought about that as like a site of interrogation before, you know, it was like, well, photo albums are photo albums. And I was like, photo albums mean something. So that, so those things, I like, Bowden allow, allowed me to like interrogate more spaces and complicate things that I just assumed were I don't know, like happenstance or right. something. So I assume that along with those complications came complicated discussions about those different theories and you obviously encountered people that you didn't necessarily agree with. How did you navigate those spaces and how do you think that the classroom experience, did it, I guess, um, promote that dialogue? Did it promote people to disagree and work, really grapple with each other? Here? Yes. Yeah, I think there's this thing about like we can be, our ideas can be in conflict without us being in conflict, right? I think it's like a, I believe that. Um, and I, I worry sometimes that so, I worry sometimes in places like this, uh, we don't have the uncomfortable conversations because they're uncomfortable. And so many people have lived these worlds where like comfort is, uh, people have privileged comfort over so many things. 
Um, and that makes me sad that like that might be how some people go through places like this. Um, and I've always thought that like a professor, that's why I love Yarbrough. Cause you know, a lot of people have say what you will about Yarbrough. She like doesn't mince her words. You know, like we, I'll never forget we walked into this one class and we, she said, what is the ruling passion of the noblest mind? It was like this thing about the text and nobody knew. It's like eight of us. It's like a senior seminar. And she was just like, I've never been more embarrassed I'm embarrassed class is over and we were like what <laughs> um, wow. but she was so serious it was like I mean she was just such a G about it you're like okay okay <laughs> press whatever and I do love uh, you know people who like push hold people here accountable especially people who like can be so who have lived lives of such comfort and being here is comfortable right like there's you could go through Bowdoin and never sort of worry about so many things that people all across the world are worrying about so I do think people need to figure out how to have tougher conversations. And around race, it's like, you know, people say this often that like, I don't speak for all black people. Like I don't have to talk about everything that's race related in class, which I believe is real, but also people, uh, people just need to like be okay with saying the like silly thing or the thing that they don't think is right. And we need to encourage people to create spaces where that's okay, mm -hmm. you know? Cause like we'll only learn by like this fighting of idea, our ideas can be in conflict without us being in conflict. Of course. But you know, I really like to, and people have written about this, and there have been so many op-eds in the New York Times recently, and all other types of publications. And they write about the growing culture of safe spaces, and that means a lot of things for different people. How do you balance, or how do colleges balance the need or the necessity for these safe spaces with the necessity for community as a whole, and recognizing that all of us are here at Bowdoin, but we also need our safe spaces. And what does a safe space mean to you? Yeah, I think, oh, I think, hmm, let me think. I, <laughs> I think safe space, I think there is, there's something about like affinity groups, right? That like, right. I need to be around people like me so that we can talk about shared experience. And I think that's real. And the fact that like, I'm around people like me doesn't mean that I don't like people like you, right? And like, there's this, like people get in their feelings sometimes about the, you know, and. And like, and then sort of, uh, white people push back and say, "Well, why can I have like affinity spaces?" And I'm like, America is your affinity space. Right? <laughs> um, um, and there is, you know, I do think there's something about. <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> uh, I do think that, um, and I said this to somebody today, is that like somebody has to organize white. Somebody has to organize white people, right? That like, there's a part of it that like. And I mean that, right? That I don't know, I don't, I can name white privilege, I can see it, I totally know its impact, but I don't have it, right? Mm -hmm. And like somebody that has it has to like help people under, has to help people who have it understand it and use it to disrupt it, right? That there's, that like a part of white people work is like organizing, you know, white people. And I think that that is, that that is real when we think about like how we help people think about, you know, I know that like no white person in this room owns slaves, right? I get it. And like when, but the fact that like people still have to say that is like a wild, that's like wild. And like, you don't have to be guilty to like understand that you have privilege, no fault of you, not because you did anything good or bad, right? Like you didn't, you weren't born like amazing necessarily and, and got all this privilege, right? Like you have it as a function of your skin color. Um, and then we have to be able to talk about that in ways that like people don't receive threateningly and, and doesn't act, it doesn't cause people to like shut down. Like nobody wins in that space either. So he's going off that idea. I love your glasses. Okay. <laughs> I'm clearly My distracted. Apologies. I was a sixth grade math teacher, so I'm like, eh, you know, but I'm here. So he's going off that, that, going off that idea of, what, of white people's responsibility being to, <laughs> sorry, to organize white people and then arguably be allies to other marginalized groups. Let's take it to Black Lives Matter for a little bit. How do you think that allyship can be played out in the day in the day to day lives, yes. and especially at Bowdoin, where we're not actively fighting in Ferguson, we're not getting tear gassed. Yeah, for that matter. I think a key part of allyship, and I said this last time I was here, but it's like you know people need to open themselves up to learn about other people's experiences in authentic ways, and then ask people what they need. Right? Like you you don't get to allyship is not like an is is not like a self appointment. Like you don't get to make yourself my ally. Right? Like we got to talk about this. This is an invitation. <laughs> um, <laughs> And like to really ally, to use your resources in the in the service of other people, you need to know what other people need, right? And like you don't actually get to determine that for them. And that's about all types of allies, whether it's like queer allies, like race, whatever it is. Um, and then in places like Bowdoin, I'm all you know. I talked about this with Clayton. Like, how do we, how are we intentional about creating community? Because there's this false idea at places like this that just like changing the composition of the student body like means community is better, right? And that actually isn't necessarily bless you true. 
So I think about there are way more black and brown faces here than when I was here. Like, I'm looking around like, look at y'all. Um, <laughs> but like, that doesn't actually mean that it's a healthier college campus, right? It doesn't mean that like community is any different. It could be the same, you know, tired community that people complained about before. And we have to be thoughtful about how do we like make community, how do we like get people to be in, in relationship with each other that might not otherwise be? Like how do we do that as intentional work, especially in a place like this where you can do it, right? All of you could ostensibly know everybody else in this room. Like you could do that. That's not like a, a wild notion, that is real. And how do we like set that up for people? Because I think about being an alum, and I see voting people all over the place. And and like you know, I was student body president, so I knew everybody who overlapped when I was here. But like that can be so many other people's experience too. Like you don't you don't have to be in some like college role to to have that. And I worry because there are only like eighteen thousand living uh, like alum or something ever. You know, like they're not a ton of voting alum. So like we actually could we can continue to be in community in more robust ways. Mm. Thank you. Um, to switch gears a bit. Um, you were at Teach for America, mm -hmm. right after you graduated Bowdoin mm -hmm. uh, in New York. And critics of TFA believe that the core members are not given enough training, are not given enough time uh, to be effective first-time <laughs> teachers. <laughs> These are the critics. I'm, I get it. So get I'm it. interested in hearing your perspective on your experience and if you think you could have been a more effective teacher in your first year of teaching. Yep. So I've never worked for Teacher America. That's my disclaimer. I like was a Teacher America core member. I was an employee of the New York City public school system, and then I was the number two in uh, Baltimore City Public Schools for human capital, and then number two in uh, human capital for Minneapolis Public Schools. So I've worked in three public school systems. Uh, TFA, like all organizations, is like an imperfect place. Um, I, TFA was like my avenue for, for getting into the classroom, and I loved it. I was a good teacher. My first year, all of my kids did well on the state exam except for one, and I will never forget uh, her. Because um, <laughs> like, it was my fault. I like think about her all the time. So, so yeah, so all of my kids did really well. Um, I definitely could have been a better teacher. There is something about, like, there's this myth that, like, there are these that there's like this whole host of like really amazing um, teacher prep programs at scale. Again, like not talking about one school, but at scale. So when I think about, I hired in Baltimore, I was responsible for, I managed uh, the hiring of 800-ish teachers a year. And we could not have, like literally, from a numbers perspective, could not have filled the classrooms without Teacher America and the fellows, the fellows. Like we just couldn't, like I would not have had science teachers, I wouldn't have had math teachers, like I physically would not have been able to fill classrooms. Um, and then there is this thing too that like an accelerated program is not, and nobody wants to hear this part, but an accelerated program is not for everybody. There are some people who can like learn how to teach in six weeks and be an effective teacher, and there's some people who can't, and that doesn't make the people who can't like worse people, right? Like you might need longer time, and like that makes sense to me too. Um, but I do think I was an effective teacher. My second year, I was, um, you know, all of my kids did really well, half of them did. Uh, got the highest that you could get on the state exam. I think about Ms. Bales, who was another teacher with me, who was my year in TFA. She got the highest test scores in the borough of Brooklyn, right? Like all of her kids were on grade level in reading or above. You know, like we got to do good work. And there was something about um, Teacher America has a really great selection process. So I do think the people I was in there with were really good. Were they all great? No, right? Like Lord, no. Just like everybody here, <laughs> you know, has some work to do. But. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I think that sometimes the criticisms are like unfair, um, that it is not like the worst thing that has ever happened to public education. And there is actually a teacher shortage, right? Like that is not like people to make that up. And as somebody who hired 800 teachers, and in Minneapolis I hired 400 teachers, that like the diversity of the teaching um, population was actually really important. That I would not have had teachers of color in Minneapolis if I didn't hire uh, teacher American teachers, right? I like wouldn't. I like needed Teacher America to be a pipeline for teachers of color, so I didn't hire a hundred percent white teachers, right? Like, and that and that was important to me as a person who was um, leading the hiring for a school system that was seventy percent people of color, you know? Yeah, and you know, so I forgot to mention that these questions were all um, pulled from people who emailed in, and this one ties directly to your work in Minneapolis and in Baltimore, um, and it's one of my favorites. How do you think that? you best worked to counter structural racism in the classroom from the administrative level? How do you go about affecting the change when you're so high up at a micro level? Yeah, so I, my work was focused on um, 
it was focused on like the adults. So I did, so once I left the classroom, I did very little work in schools unless it was like firing a teacher or like something, you know, adverse. If I had to go to your school, it was never good. And um, <laughs> so what I did was try and make sure that only the best people were in front of our kids. Mm -hmm. So Minneapolis, when I got to Minneapolis, we literally did not screen teachers. Like it wasn't, like we just didn't screen them. So if you had like a pulse and a license, we like would send you out to schools. <laughs> and I and I mean that, that was like literally, I mean it was like the, why I got there and I put in this, you know, we started interviewing teachers and people were like, DeRay's so smart. And I'm like, I think I'm smart, but I didn't invent interviewing, right? Like that was, like that, was, that, wasn't, that wasn't me. Um, but really we started to like, we started interviewing teachers and we started to ask, we asked this question about like people's, ex like do you, essentially do you expect that like low income kids can learn as much as wealthy kids? That was like a, we like literally asked every teacher who applied, that was the question we asked them. And you'd be shocked at the people who'd be like, no. And we're like, if you, if that is a core belief of yours, you actually can't teach our kids, right? So we started to like sift through people and that was my way of guaranteeing that like, you wouldn't get to one of our kids if you actually believed as like a belief that you would tell the person in charge of hiring that you just don't believe that like all kids can actually learn, right? Because when you see a school where like all the fourth graders are failing, it's not like dumb fourth graders, right? Like there's, there's something at play there that is like more than those kids. And Minneapolis, again, has like one of the highest achievement gaps in America. So they were, I remember there was an elementary school that like had to cancel the celebration, like the academic celebration because literally no child was proficient. And you know, I'm sitting in the central office like that is in that's like wild, right? Um, and from the central office, I would try and figure out like how to move the teachers around, get new teachers, support teachers better. Like that was sort of the work I did, but it was it was removed from like classroom work. So seeing as you were doing so much at the administrative level, what made you leave those positions to go down to Ferguson to become a protester? And yeah, Black Lives Matter. I originally left, so Mike got killed on August 9th. On August 16th, I was, uh, I got in the car, drove to St. Louis, didn't know anybody. I put on Facebook, like I'm going to St. Louis. I hope somebody knows somebody who, you know, is in St. Louis, mm -hmm. a lot of faith. And seven hours in, I got a call from uh, a Teacher America person who was like, I'll put you in touch with somebody. I got to St. Louis, the QT, which is now gone, which was burned, many of you probably saw on TV, the QT is a gas station. That was like a main meeting site, so I met Brittany at the, QT, she like found some Teacher America alum where I could stay with them. And then two days later, uh, Ivy, who was a, my class of Bowdoin, she saw my Facebook post and I stayed with Ivy for the next sort of five days and then I would fly back and forth and I would stay with Ivy. So it is a, a joint Teacher America story and then a Bowdoin story in terms of my initial days. Um, but I left because so much of my work had been focused on like making sure kids had like great teachers and, and the teachers were supported and were doing good work. And, and then there was this thing about like, you gotta be alive to learn, right? That I'm gonna do all this work to make sure kids have great teachers, but some will never get to, like they just won't get there. So Tamir will never get to high school, Mike never made it to college, right? Like Ayana never made it to middle school. And there was something about like, you gotta be alive. And like, I wanted that to be my work. Um, and the achievement gap has been a gap for way longer than I've been alive. So me stepping out of the game for a couple years or whatever wasn't gonna, again, I think I'm important. I don't think I'm single-handedly, you know, closing the achievement gap. <laughs> Um, so I was like, let me figure out how to use the privilege I have and the access I have to like think about ending police violence. So, you know, you left and you just talked about some of those kids who didn't make it to middle school, high school, college. I can only imagine the anger and the frustration that comes with seeing the system fail those kids. I mean, maybe it wasn't even built to support them to begin with. Um, but how do you see that frustration and that anger strategically informing your work as an activist? Um, I'm gonna take a picture of them real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the worst. I'm telling you, Bowdoin is like so home that I feel like I'm in my living room or something, it's great. <laughs> um, I don't have an apartment or a car, so don't be like, DeRay said he has a living room, I don't. <laughs> Um, in terms of the anger, you know, I, I don't think I'm angry anymore. Like I like had to move past being afraid. You know, people say I'm afraid for my safety. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not angry anymore. I'm trying to be like focused, right? Like how to how to like be focused on sort of ending the crisis. I do get I get hurt. You know, I, I like watch these videos of people being gunned down by the police, and it just like isn't fair. You know. And I think the only thing that makes me angry is the police. We're like, you know, people are protesting and then like you get tear gas all of a sudden or like, you know, I remember one time we were on, we were like, people shut down this highway and the police didn't know what they were doing in St. Louis. They still don't know what they're doing in general, but in the early days, they definitely didn't know. 
and the wind was blowing and he started pepper spraying people, but the wind blew. So like they got pepper sprayed, I got pepper sprayed, you know, like we all, the police are running because they, he, like the wind blew the pepper spray back on his face. <laughs> I get pepper sprayed in this eye, so I'm like, you know, I can't see. And it was something about like, that just makes me angry, right? Like that is just A, absurd that that's even something we have to deal with. And B, like you should just be better at your job. Like this is why we're out here, because you're like <laughs> not very good at what you're doing. Um, so that makes me angry. And I get angry at like the lies, you know? So you think out in Baltimore and people were, the police shot like a smoke bomb, which is, it is smoke. It's like a canister of smoke and it goes, and it doesn't, you know, tear gas makes like your face sting and, and it makes your eyes water, um, and then pepper balls make you make you sneeze, and it makes you it sort of makes your face sting, um, but it doesn't make your eyes water. It just makes you sneeze. But smoke bombs are like just smoke, and like but it makes this loud pop. So like people sort of run because it sounds it, like the sound is the most intense sound, and it set off in Baltimore. It set off a trash can. Like the police shot it, trash can catches on fire, and the police are tweeting. The Baltimore police are tweeting like protesters set a trash can on fire. And it was like, that actually didn't happen. So like John Swain from The Guardian, he writes back to the Baltimore, the police being like, you, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great, you know? And like those sort of lies actually make me more upset yeah. because it's like, you should be able to survive the truth, right? If you right. can't like, if your work can't survive the truth, then this is just not a win. Um, and the police, you know, they legit have, independent of how I feel about the police, they have lied to us. Like they have actually told untruths. And that just like isn't what, what I imagine the government is supposed to be in the service of. I think going along with that violence and a little bit of those lies we're talking, I wanted to switch gears just a little bit to talk about major social policy movements in American society. And some people, or some parts of the population believe that it was not until there was a severe crisis and well-publicized violence, i.e. Ferguson or i.e. Baltimore, um, that majority of our society was motivated to substantially change or at least respond to activists on the issues. Do you believe this is the case for Black Lives Matter? which I guess I mentioned some examples of. And do you think there would be a Black Lives Matter movement if black people had not gotten killed by the police? Good question. I think there was something about Mike's body being in the street that like got people, you know? I think if his body had not laid in the street, like there was something about those people on, the, on August 9th seeing his body in the street for three and a half hours that like changed everything. Um, you know, I will never say that the protesters have been violent. I will always maintain that the only violent people since August have been the police. Um, I think that protesters have definitely damaged property, and that is not good, but again, uh, we haven't killed anybody, and the police have killed 800 people. Um, the police have killed somebody every day this year except for nine days and killed people in all states but three, and we have not done any of those things. Um, I do think there's this really fascinating article called In Defense of Looting by um, this guy in the New Inquiry, and I... I think everybody should read it, but he argues that like if property had not been damaged, nobody ever would have responded. That it was not that like really it was if, if somebody had not burned down the QT in Ferguson, um, that that America never would have looked at like America. The, the idea of property is like so deeply rooted in the psyche of how America privileges things that that is actually what started the the unrest being national. And I, I think there's some validity to that, as we see property damage across the country be the thing that like the news and all this stuff actually gets worked up about. So do you think there's something about that? I think that physical confrontation is really important. I think that like the moment the protesters leave the streets, I think we will lose. I think that, that like there's something about the threat of um, the threat of people being in streets and disrupting things, whether it is sort of sitting in parking lots and like shutting down buildings because like the people just can't drive home or in streets or like any other type of creative protest. I think that that's like really important. But again, the police have been the violent people since August. And on a more personal level and Get ready because we're going to start asking the personal ones now. Um, how, how do you sustain yourself emotionally, especially? How do you go about your day to day and not go absolutely insane? Yeah, I, I like have great friends. That is like really it. You know, I like tweet often. I'm thankful for my friends and their love, and I tweet that when I'm like ready to lose it. Um, yeah, I have great friends who like keep me grounded. I also know that like. The, so I block 15,000 people on Twitter. I get death threats, like all that stuff. And I know that like so much of that is not necessarily about me. It's about this image of me that people have. And I'm okay with that. So I like don't take it personal. I like can sort of move past it. One of the hardest things about sort of online hate is that I have to consume it before I block you, right? So like I've read all, you call me everything but a child of God and I had to read all of it before I blocked you. And there are days when that actually just becomes a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and I do have to deal with, you know, I wake up and it's like a new criticism. So it's like the, you know, I'm, I'm doing this two-day lecture at Yale and Fox News absolutely hates me. And so Fox <laughs> tweets out to their six million followers, like DeRay McKesson Lane's teaching gig at Yale. So people think I'm like a tenure faculty member. So <laughs> like there's like a part of the academia who's, who's pissed. I'm and sorry, <laughs> I apologize. You made it. It's I'm good. so sorry. I love it. She's like, <laughs> 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 There's a part of the academia who was upset with me. They're like, we worked our entire careers. I don't know how DeRay got to Yale. And it's like two days, y'all. I'm there for two days. Like, there's nothing. To do. Um, so there is a part of, like, the rumor aspect that I just have to, every day, it's like some new, am I getting paid by George Soros? Am I, like, you know, there are people who, oh, we had a meeting at the White House the other day um, with Valerie Jarrett. It was a, a productive meeting. And when they called me, they said, DeRay, you know, this meeting is off the record. And I'm telling Stephanie, who is like the director of African American Outreach, I'm like, Stephanie, as long as the White House logs are public, it's not off the record. Like, I'm gonna have to tell somebody I was here because the people that hate me literally check the White House logs every day because clearly I'm the Illuminati and I planned Ferguson with Obama. So, <laughs> like, I literally, so I had to tell her, like, Stephanie, we need to figure this out. And at the end of the meeting, Valerie goes, she like says to the public relations person, like, when are we gonna talk about this? And I'm looking like, when are we gonna talk? You know, like, I need to tweet that I was at the White House so it doesn't become this like scandal later that DeRay like snuck into the White House. And, <laughs> um, and we were actually there on Wednesday, we were there on Wednesday with Valerie and then on Friday for the Obama vice, like the, the, the prison thing. And on Friday, we actually didn't tweet we were at the White House, we tweeted like we saw the premiere of the video just because two days and one week at the White House would have caused a tizzy for people, um, but they can still search. And that becomes like an exhausting thing to have to think about like, how do I make sure I maintain my legitimacy in the midst of all of these things? As long as maintaining your personal self and your emotional health, how do you maintain your physical health and your physical well-being? How do you deal with housing, plane tickets? How do you support yourself as an activist? Yeah, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gave, I tried to be really thoughtful about like giving up so I made 110 before I quit. So I like, you know, had a salary and you know, I, I like legitimately walked away from, from that career. I like have friends who've been able to help me. Um, but it was important to me that like, you can't, if you were mad at me, you were mad at me. You can't call my boss because I don't have one. You can't call like, you know, you, it's just me and I don't have to worry about the baggage of, of a grant or like a funder. Like I literally just get to move and say what I, what I think is real. Um, I don't know how, you know, I'm, thankful and I don't know how I'll sustain this sort of like long term but I also if I'm fighting the police 20 years from now like I messed up like something didn't go right um but like I think that we can actually like, end police violence soon like I think that we can at least at the structural level we can do that but that but I don't have like a deep answer besides like it works you know in a lot of places where I fly because people are like how can Dre fly everywhere is that I'm actually not paying for that you know like the places that invite me are sort of doing that so because I don't have a car I don't have an apartment I like barely have health insurance thank you Obamacare um <laughs> thank you in a good way that is a good thing thank you Obamacare I have health insurance um <laughs> Yeah, like it is, I have very little, I do have Bowdoin loans, so if any rich person, you know, alum who wants to pay my Bowdoin loans, that'd be great. But that is, I don't have like a lot of expenses anymore, so I do, I am like a professional couch surfer. I'm like on a lot of people's couches um, across the country, and, and I wear the same, you know, six things every day, or like every six days, so that also, you know, works. And, you know, I want to leave time for questions from the audience, so one last question from us. Um, you were BSG president, um, so you know Bowdoin very, very well. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are for students at Bowdoin, or students around the colleges and colleges around the country more generally, in terms of addressing issues of social justice? Yeah, what I've, can we do better? I've like always thought that like students, especially here, like have underestimated their power. You know, I fought with Barry every day. I texted Barry today, and he was being very Barry over the text. <laughs> um, <laughs> I texted him a picture. He's like, uh, he's like in this picture at the McKean Center. So I took a picture of it and I texted it to him and he wrote back, I look young. It was like, okay, Barry, like what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, side note, but you know, I think we fought all the time and there was something about like, you have four year tenure here, right? Like this is yours. Like the best that Dean Foster and anybody can do is try and wait you out. Like that is what they can do that like, you know, cause you are going to leave at some point. 
Um, <laughs> but while you're here, this is this is yours. And like I've I've always worried about people like understanding that this ex that like the infrastructure around the college exists because you are at the college. And there's like something about that that is so powerful. There's like you get to make this experience what you want it to be. And I worry that like the comfort of Bowdoin sort of masks that for people. That like it's like what do you have to be upset about? What, you know, because relatively everything's sort of fine, right? Even the worst things are like okay-ish. Um, and like, you know, I want people to think about like creating a world that could be better at every step of the way. And like, I worry sometimes that this place can be so comfortable that people sort of forget that, right? That the world can be a better place, even if it is in like small doses. And like, people have to do that work that like progress is not inevitable. Progress requires work too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, I suppose, can I ask one do you want, do you have yes. one question? Yeah, so I just want to ask one more question to you. Um, I was obviously looking online all of your tweets and trying to get a better sense of who you were. Yeah. And I came across a tweet from Montel Williams, for, for those Lord. of you who don't know, hosted his own talk show for a couple years. And his set quote, his tweet said something along the lines of, at DeRay, you are not Martin Luther King. Let's make that very clear. And I think that while that was a very negative way to compare to Martin Luther King, I think that there are a lot of people, maybe they're, maybe they're at Bowdoin or beyond, who do believe you are somewhat of Martin Luther King and that you are the perceived leader of the Black Lives Matter movement. How do you take that? And do you think that there will ever be a perceived leader of the Black Lives Matter movement? So let me say, you know, me and Montel have talked after that. And, you know, what I wrote back to Montel that day was like, you're not Oprah, and that's okay. <laughs> um, because, you know, I was like, you know, you're not Oprah, that's okay. And I support you anyway, Montel, right? I want you to be free too, Montel. Um, <laughs> It was great. The best part about that is that the King Center, like the actual King Center in Atlanta, tweeted to Montel and was like, that is not in the spirit of King. It was great. It was like, bam. Um, and I like got on the phone with them later. They were like, Dre, we have your back 100%. I was like, I love Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that I get that like in some ways, me and so many other people have become symbols in the movement. Mm -hmm. I think that what, one of the things we learned from the civil rights movement is that like you make one leader and it become, if they fall, everything falls, right? So you try to be really thoughtful about like there's so many people leading and doing incredible work. Some of us are more visible than other people, but like the work, if I, if I like end Twitter tonight for me, like the movement will go on. There's so many other people across the country who are doing incredible stuff and we all know each other and we try and like amplify each other's work and we try to be intentional about that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think I am one of many people who are like helping to, to keep the work alive. Um, I'm not the only one, right? And I'm like really thoughtful. I'm not the movement. I didn't start the movement. I can't stop the movement, right? Like the movement is many people. The movement is bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It's gonna take all of us, like are things that I like really believe and I try and do that work um, to tell people that, like even though I'm like hyper visible in this space for some people, too visible for some people. They're like, get Teray out of here. It's like, okay. Um, one more, and I, after, after that you guys, I promise it. Um, <laughs> what are the advantages or disadvantages of such a decentralized social movement? Yeah, I think the advantage is that we can be really nimble, right? I don't need to, I can call my like three friends who I'm around all the time in the movement space and we can like decide to do something that has max, like Campaign Zero that we launched, which is this, camp, which is this platform around police, ending police violence, like policy solutions. We were able to do with like minimal friction, but involved a lot of people, and that like matters, right? Like because because I don't have to go through some crazy chain of command, we can like we can be much more nimble. I think one of the hard parts is like there is still this people want leaders, right? They want people want one voice, people want sort of one place to go, and sometimes people will go anywhere for anywhere to satisfy that need, right? So you look up and you're like, who? I don't even know who that, like, I don't, they're like, Dre, do you know? And I'm like, mm, I've been around since August and have never heard of that, them, the, you know. So there's something about that sometimes that is really hard. And um, I do think that, yeah, I think the biggest challenge is that people want a one or a two or a three, and in the absence of it, they'll make it up. And like, I think that's really, so people want to say like, you know, Black Lives Matter is not endorsing candidates, right? And that really is one sort of group in the movement has said that, that is not the entire movement, right? Or like when I met with Bernie and me and so many other people, um, we were meeting on like a larger, for a larger group of people, but like there are some people who never want to meet with any of the candidates because they don't believe in sort of, sort of politics at that level. And like, that's also fair, right? That people can pick and choose how to be involved in the movement, I think is like a real, is important. Um, so thank you for taking thank our you. questions. Um, we're going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, you guys see two mics out there? Awesome. Um, so feel free to ask your questions and uh, go ahead and take the mic. Uh, but please do keep it brief and keep it to an actual question. 
So. Daisha in the front. Right here. Oh. Hey, how you doing? Okay. Uh, okay, so to keep it quick, I'm in the class called Introduction to Black Performance Studies. Shout out to Professor Knight. We read a article by Larry Neal about the black arts movement and the black power movement, and so I'm going to share a quote, and I just want to hear your response. Uh, it says, okay. An implicit in the act of protest is the belief that a change will be forthcoming once the masters are aware of the protester's grievance. Parentheses, the very word connotes begging supplication to the gods. In parentheses, only when that belief has faded and protesting's end will black art begin. And so in, in the context, like, what do you think about protest as a means towards creating a new a new. So I agree. With, I agree with like the spirit of it. I would push and say that it seems like the beginning of it says that it's this notion that like once people understand the grievances, things will change. And this is a big fight that Tana Hesse and I had um, about his latest book and about just how he writes in general. And I love Tana Hesse codes. Um, is that like progress is not so? My critique of Tana Hesse is this idea that like there's no hope in his text, right? Like I read it and I'm like, where's the hope, Tana Hesse? Right? Like show me where's the hope. And his push is that like, um, he doesn't want people to think that like progress is inevitable, that like we can, we can just get so excited about what could be that we just think it's gonna happen. And I think that like my push to you, would be, or my push to this quote would be this idea that like, people actually know the grievances, right? Like we, we didn't like, you know, black people have been disenfranchised and abused by the state forever here. And people have known the grievances and that has never been enough to like make change. Um, that like it, it takes actual work to like force systems to change. And if we believe that like just people knowing will lead to change, like we will never win. So that'd be my push. I do think there's a role for art to help people, to wake people up and to sort of mobilize people to think about the world and possibilities differently. So we think about people like Octavia Butler, we think about The Giver, think about all these texts, artists who like, who highlighted the possibility of new worlds that was really important for people. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions, sorry. But one, I know that you said you had an amazing experience at Bowdoin, but what are some of the challenges you had to face being an Afri African-American male on this campus? And two, you, um, I know you're fighting to end police brutality, but how do you do that without changing the mindset of the police and the people in this country? Because I know from personal experience, people are kind of stuck in their ways. And even with legislation, how does that change the actions of the police? Good question. So we, don't, we actually don't ever talk about police brutality anymore. We talk about police violence, because the police have been violent since August. Um, I, there is, the mindset question is like an important question. I think that it centers on like uh, changing the way we think about safety, that the safety of communities is predicated, is not predicated on the presence of police, but it's about so many other things. And it's about jobs, workforce development, healthcare, that like we have to decenter police as like, as as being integral to our understanding of safe communities. Um, and that's really important that like, you don't need to know my name not to harm me. So people are like, well, the police should know everybody in neighborhoods. That's like really, the police should know all the black people. That's like really what that statement says. Because people, in the, nobody's saying in the Upper West Side, the police should just like know everybody. That's like not a, you know, that isn't what people mean when they mean community policing. Um, but we have to like tease out this notion of safety that we don't need to have a police first response to everything. Like sometimes when trauma happens, we can send other people that aren't the police, um, and that's real. We just have to reimagine what safety is, um, and I think that's really important. And then in terms of Bowdoin, you know, Bowdoin, like everything else, like Teacher America, like any other thing I've been a part of, was imperfect. So did I have my moments of like, get me out of here? Definitely, right? Just like I'm sure you, any anybody would have. I think as a um, as a black man, it was sort of different. I was a campus leader from from I was in a, a three term class president and a two term student body president, so I did have like a little more access. And there were not very many black people here, so there were probably like fifteen or twenty black people in my class. So we were all sort of close, just because you know we all we got in some days. Um, so I, I like understood that there was like a lot of room for we like needed to grow as a campus, but I do think that it was different because we didn't have all these external inputs on us. Like it, Facebook had just started. We were able to create community here and sort of like fight about things and not have all these other digital things sort of 
pushing on us for better or for worse. And I've seen that change the way people act on college campuses, right? That I don't even know what I would be like if I had Twitter or Yik Yak or whatever stuff like exists now that like changes the tone and tenor of campus. Um, Cause we didn't have that. So we did have this race incident and it was a big deal and we had all these forums about it and all this stuff. But like we were able to, in many ways, like talk it through, um, which didn't make campus like 100% perfect, but it did sort of open up space to do that. Um, and there weren't a ton of black men. And when we got, when I got to Bowdoin, the seniors were really upset with the college. They were just like bitter and upset for all the, like for reasons that made sense to them. But I remember when I was a first year, we made the choice that we would not leave the college like them, right? That like whatever happened to us, we would fight this place tooth and nail and kill and like sort of destroy it before we let it destroy us like it did to them. And that was like a conscious, we were just like, we won't, this place won't do that to us. And we like worked really hard to make that real. So I've seen many responses about um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And a lot of people say, um, you know, this wouldn't be a problem if Obama didn't come into presidency and um, such. How do you respond to claims like that? Yeah, the police were killing people way before Obama was president, right? But the only thing that changed now is that people got to see the violence because of social media, that people saw the tweets, people saw the videos. Like, um, but I think Obama becomes this really interesting scapegoat for so many racing. Somebody did say something. I, I was in New Orleans talking about Katrina recently, and somebody said that like Katrina would have been the Ferguson if Obama hadn't been president. I thought was like an interesting notion. This idea that like there was so much turmoil on the heels of Katrina, and then and then and then Obama came, and for so many people that message of like hope and change sort of like tampered or tempered that that intensity that was post Katrina, um, and then people got disillusioned by the hope and change the hope message, and and then we sort of got to Ferguson. But I don't. I think that that's like an easy. I think that's like a really reductive argument that like sort of lacks so much nuance. Um. Hello. Um, so my question for you is about Campaign Zero. Um, first of all, congratulations again on, on compiling something so all-encompassing to put forward to the government. That's amazing. Um, but there are a lot of different components about it, which I know is like everyone's first thing about, you know, like are you prioritizing these things and whatnot. Um, I would love to get the inside scoop on what talks at the White House have been like, but I don't really want to know that more so as what do you feel like people have been most receptive to in terms of what they feel like is the most pragmatic parts of the proposal? What are the most pragmatic parts? And um, in your mind, what do you think is going to be the most feasible in terms of creating long-term change? Yeah, I think that, um, so we were really intentional about having the 10 boxes, right? One of our learnings from the civil rights movement was that we didn't, and I had a great conversation with Diane Nash, Freedom Rider, and, and Bernard Lafayette, who, who organized in Selma, excuse me. And we didn't want people to think that like, you know, with the civil rights movement, it was like desegregation, Voting Rights Act, like those are the wins, right? And we see that like while that got us like really far, it didn't so much didn't change. And what we wanted to do is like help people think about complex wins in a simple way. So the graphic is like relatively simple, but it's complex in terms of like it has a lot of things. And what we're saying to people is that unless all of these things change, we won't end police violence. We want you to think we don't want you to think that like body cameras are like the thing. It is body cameras plus 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 plus, right? I think that in terms of what I think is pragmatic, people get the body cameras thing, though they've implemented it in, in all the worst ways, right? That the technology around body cameras has actually outpaced the guidance, so that's not helpful, right? So you see these laws popping up that are actually the absolute not what we want, that they are actually making, they're reinforcing this notion of surveillance in communities, and that's actually not what we want. And then the independent investigators, like there's so many of those early, but like ending broken windows policing, like it shouldn't be illegal to spit, right? That that's actually, that like the enforcement of spitting laws is definitely racially encoded or income encoded. Um, so those, those sort of things I think are easy. I'm interested in box 10, the police union contracts. The police union contracts are wild all across the country. It's one of the things that I think has gotten the least visibility because it seems so technical. Um, so we've been trying to create create um, avenues for reporters to enter them in ways that are easier. They're like, what does it mean that in so many states, uh, uh, police officers' personnel files are purged? Like, they literally are purged. So if a police officer does something wrong, in one year cycles, two year, three year cycles, literally all the information is just purged. So like a police officer would do something and you'll look back and be like, oh, that police officer is amazing. No, the file just got deleted, right, as a part of the contract. And those sort of things, we're trying to like bring visibility to them because even people who like love the police think that's unfair, right? That that actually just isn't fair. Or you think about Chicago, where like to, for a police officer to get a lie detector test, the person who accuses them of, of 
abuse has to take a lie detector test and pass it before the police officer has to. And like that standard is never applied to the people they arrest, right? That like that there are all these things that are just unfair. Um, so of all the boxes, I think that that is the one that I like hope gets a little more visibility because it's like the untold story that the police are truly hiding in plain sight. Me? Okay. Um, well, in your interview with Wolf Blitzer, uh, you. Uh, brought up this notion of the weaponization of blackness. Uh, there's so many ways you can interpret that, and, uh, and there's so many ways I think about that. I just wanted to, I want you, I wanted you to further embark on that. Yeah, yeah I'd say that you know, black, black people are truly never unarmed in America, right? That like, that my blackness is always a weapon to, in in, in some ways, um, and that's really hard because the police say that like they were armed, and it's like what we've seen is all these people who are killed without weapons have always carried the weapon of their skin, and like. And we name that so that we can highlight the fact that like race is always at play here. And that's what we say that like, you know, I, my first sign in, in St. Louis was like, um, my blackness is not a weapon, right? That was my thing, this idea that like what, what the police have done is like literally weaponize blackness. So like you are never unarmed in this America. Hi there. Um, so I feel like I personally have had a great privilege of being able to sort of experience the world and the way in the different ways that it exists. Um, so I've been able to like see many people, hear many stories. Um, but when I go back home, I grew up in Harlem in New York. I often feel like people see the world only like the way it exists in their immediate surroundings. And sometimes I wonder like, how can we elevate people to sort of look beyond what's immediately in front of them? And I'm just curious, what you think, like how you think we can do that, and also how schools could potentially play a role, um, given that there are so many like limitations, like whether they be financial or like who are the people that these people like everyone should talk to, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think that so I, I push on this notion of elevate, but I would I agree with you about like giving like how do we create access, right? Um, I think that the digital space can be really interesting. I think about Google Cardboard. You know, it's funny I tweet about Google Cardboard and people are like Dereza is paid to tweet about Google stuff. Um, but Google Cardboard is like this really interesting, like low cost, it like costs $2 and it's like virtual reality. So you can go to Paris and Italy and all these things like with an iPhone and like it literally is like a cardboard box that Google makes that like has these two ocular things that like are virtual reality, right? And like I would love for kids across the country to have them because they're literally $2. They're like, I got one because I was on this YouTube panel and I was like, this is so cool. Um, so those sort of things, I, I'm interested in like how technology can actually open up the world for people without their bodies necessarily moving. I think that's like really, I think that's like an interesting notion. And then how can we have people explore their own homes a little better, right? Like I, I taught in East New York, Brooklyn, and my kids would be like, you know, have you ever been to Manhattan? And I'm like, what you mean have I ever been? That's like the train, you know, like, where, why are you not in Manhattan? You know, like, so, um, so how do we... How do we like create space for people to like actually explore their homes better too? Because there's like a treasure where you are, um, and I believe that. But I do think that like I, I have faith in digital spaces to like open up the world for people. Um, so, as you probably know, we have a teach-in here October first, and from what I understand, um, there's a decent number of faculty who are kind of opposed to the teaching because they believe that uh, politics and their personal views shouldn't encroach in the classroom in that way. And I was just wondering how you would respond to people who would think that. I'm not worried about the faculty. So I, and I've never been, and I love them, right? Like somebody got to teach. Um, <laughs> but like, if you want to do a teaching, this is, I'm all about this is yours, right? This is yours. And if you want to do a teaching, teach in all day long. Don't go to any of their classes and see what they do, right? Like, and like, this is, you know, this is like a, you get to, you get to make this experience what you want it to be. And like that interplay, that conflict is like, we grow from that, right? And like, I think that like, there will always be some people, faculty or not, who like, will push back when people want to push the system, that's like to be expected. And I would say like anticipate that and grow from it. Like make people show up differently to you. But I'm not like particularly worried about them. I think about so many things we did at student government and like if I was, if, if the faculty's approval was something I needed, I wouldn't have done anything. Not because the faculty didn't like me, maybe they didn't, but, but because um, you know, there is a, like, so many faculty members are here to like teach, right? And that is like what they should be doing. And some people think about their relationship to the, the larger community differently than you might, you know? 
and that is they have a right to do that. But I think that like if students want to do whatever they want to do, they should do it and like figure out what to do. I think Barry and I fought all the time. I don't forget uh, Tim, who is now, I think he left. He called me one day and he was like, DeRay, I don't know what you did to Barry, but Barry is really upset. You need to call him when he gets off the plane. And I'm like, why I got to call Barry? Barry, man, why don't he call me, right? Um, <laughs> so I get on the phone with Barry and he's like, live it, right? And I'm like, Barry, I don't know why you yell. I'm like, this is not that deep. But it was this thing about like, Barry, I did what I thought was right. Like, you're mad and I get it and you have every right to be mad and we just gonna have to figure it out, you know? And that is like a part of the work and I consider him a dear friend, um, but we like didn't agree about everything and I still love him, you know? Hi. So I remember when you first started tweeting back in August of 20, uh, whatever, and um, you said that like love was something that was really prevalent in the community of the protesters. Um, so since this work has like transformed to the level that it has, and you know their policy initiatives and all that now, um, back to the community across the nation, like community of Black folk who we're really fighting for. How has the idea of community changed since then into now, if it has? And 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 what would you say about community? How it's you know. Well. Yeah, I struggle with this notion of community. Like when, when people in the movement say talk about community, I think it really is code for like who is closest to the least advantaged people in America, which I think is a really dangerous way to think about community, right? It's like who is who has proximity to the most disadvantaged is like how I've seen so many people use community as a way to like amplify their own work, right? Like I'm closer to the most disadvantaged, therefore I'm the most authentic. And I think that's like a really dangerous way to think about that everybody needs to be organized. You know what I mean? Like all black people. Um, you know, James Blake is super, you know, wealthy and still got beat up by the police in New York City. And he got, I don't know if you saw that video, he got taken down, you know, like, they got you, James. Um, <laughs> and so, like, somebody needs to organize him too, right? That, like, the way we think about community has to be more, more inclusive than I think people say sometimes. And I will say one of, the, one of the most important things about the movement is that like the complexity of black identity is something that people are talking about in ways that they never have, right? That like when we think about queer, when we think about trans, like all these identities are now becoming able to be talked about in public spaces in ways that like just didn't exist before. People sort of had non-normative identities in, in private. Like they just weren't in the public space and they are now and I think that's really important. I also am reminded that like one of the things that was so radical about being in St. Louis is that like um, people who never would have been together came together, right? That like we were all in the same space and people were able to like deal with really tough things. I'll never forget this one moment. We were in, the police have killed like nine people since August in St. Louis, paralyzed too. I mean, it's just like a, St. Louis is a different place. And the third person they killed, Von Dara, we were right where he got killed. Um, and in that neighborhood, and the police were like wild. It was a city, Ferguson is in the county, but the city police were like a whole different thing. They were the first people to tap their batons and like all this stuff. And they had like blocked off this, this intersection, like they made a circle and we were sort of, they cut off, we got broken up into four sides and da, da, da. And I'm on this one side and this, um, this guy is yelling at the police and he's like, you faggot, da, da, da. that's what he says to the police. And he's like pissed. He should be pissed at the police. Probably should use different words. And he turns around and and he just called the police officer a faggot. And this other protester looks at him and he was, and mind you, it's like chaos, right? Like pandemonium, they're pepper spraying people like wild. And this guy looks at him and he goes, that really offended me. And the guy was like, I'm sorry. And like, it just, it was like this 10 second exchange, but I'll never forget, cause I'm sitting here like pepper spray is coming, right? But, but it was, um, <laughs> But I was so, and pepper spray is really not it. Not that I would choose to be tear gassed over anything, but pepper spray has like this awful, cause you like feel like you're okay and then you go flush your eye and it is like just all bad. But I remember being like, this, the space exists for that to happen. And we, like, first of all, those two people never would have been together. And the guy who yelled is not the most reflective person I've ever met. So when that happened, it was like the, the protest space is like really opening up new place of discourse, right? Like literally new space of discourse is happening in the midst of trauma in a way that like, I think is one of the most powerful things. Oh. Are these the last two? I feel like we are yeah. in yeah. time. Hello? Oh, um, so I have a question about, about policing in schools. So um, I grew up in the Bronx and, um, and definitely in more low income public schools in the Bronx, especially high schools, there's a huge like police presence. And I wanted to know whether you think that it would be 
more effective trying to tackle that issue from like educational board perspective or from the police like perspective because I mean it's the actual police in the schools. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't publicly talk about this because I have an unpopular belief, and it is probably because I worked at the district level. Is that like, I definitely don't think that, again, I think that in general we should not have a police first response to things, right? Whether that's a kid in the classroom or, you know, things in community. Um, but like, I think about places like Baltimore. I want, I needed the, from the human capital perspective, I needed the police there to like protect the protect them, you know. Forget like what they're doing in the school. You know, I never forget we had this one instance where like one of our employees, um, she was going into the back of the, she's like a food service worker and she got there like six o'clock in the morning to prepare breakfast. And somebody like met her at the back door and beat her to a bloody pulp, right? And it was, you know, at that moment I needed the school police to be, I wanted them at the school, you know what I mean? Like to protect the people. And I think about being a teacher in New York City is that like, if we didn't have the New York City PD like at the front sort of area, anybody would have walked in our school, you know, like, it was a deterrent to trauma happening in the school. I don't think that the police like need to like you know necessarily carry guns inside school. Or I think that that like might be too much, and they don't need to be the people that deal with discipline. But I do think that in this day and age, there is something about like what does it mean to protect um, to protect our kids in densely populated urban spaces, right, where people don't or some people might not have the best intentions you know and as somebody who worked in schools i needed her to be down there checking people's ids so that when somebody's parent got mad that i like failed their kid or something that it wasn't like that we weren't popping off in the middle class right that like that was important to me all right uh, you talked before we took the questions about the digitization of discourse essentially and i'm wondering what you think about how that's affected the elitism of social justice discourse, and whether you think that's affected how effective our discourse is at all. Yeah, there is, you know, you need a phone to participate, right, or a computer, and I think that's what you're talking about. I, I think what we've seen is people from all sort of socioeconomic statuses, races participate, and I think that's really powerful, but there is a question about like, how do you organize the people who aren't on these things, right? And then what do you do with uh, the differently able community, right? Like if you can't see, then like, what does Twitter mean to you, right? And like, how do we, I think that that's like the next frontier of us talking about this or this new organizing way. I think we need to grapple that. I don't think we have. I think that we also need to figure out, and I said this in the class I was in today, we need to figure out how to use social media to actually skill build. Right now it's been like, a, it's been storytelling and amplification. That's like what we've done. You People aren't actually like getting new skills, right? They might be getting new language. They might be thinking about the world differently, definitely getting new information. But in terms of like, giving people skills, I think if we can figure that out, coupled with how do we like get the people woke who aren't on social media, like, but potentially through social media, I think that that will be like a real win. Yeah. Cool. Last one. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.